Hey, man. Good morning. Good morning. You doing good? I'm all right. How are you? I'm all right. You know, a few weeks ago, you know, the 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 lighting people said we couldn't wear I couldn't I couldn't wear my red Razorback shirts anymore. That made me mad. So you know what I did? You went and bought. A I black went shirt. online and bought a black shirt with a Razorback. <laughs> so that's that's that'll 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 teach them. I guess you did it. I can tell. I, I, I can was, tell. They're very in their face. In their face. In their face. Hey, it is great to be with you. I'm Charlie, lead pastor here, and um, so glad that you guys are worshiping with us. And um, Mark and I, we've been doing this series, really, just kind of facing, uh, looking at uh, a lot of tough passages in the Bible with some weird, weird kind of stories where God's kind of doing things unusual. And there have been some questions that have popped up on our on our Facebook feed, our live feeds and things, and people have been asking us some other questions. So we made a decision that next Sunday... What we're going to do is we're going to have kind of an ask us anything kind of time. So during the sermon time, we're just going to essentially be taking questions. And so the best way to do that is have the questions in advance and um, to kind of know what you guys are thinking. We have some of them from our feed. So if you have any questions that have kind of popped up that are just kind of confusing or things that we could kind of help you with to help you better understand, please send those on to us. You can just email them to me, charlie at thegrovecharch.org. You can, you can put them on the, the comments there on the feed if it's more of a private question. Um, feel free to send us a Facebook message to The Grove. We would love to interact with you. All the hard questions are for you. So I'll just <laughs> let you know. I was like, Mark, right. that is a, da, 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 that's a really good question, Mark. So I'll, I'll be in I'll And be I'll charged. say thank you for that question, Charlie. I think you would be the expert no, in that that's, area. That's, that's not how this works. I outrank you. <laughs> hey, so um, this fall, uh, this last fall, we, uh, we kind of did our small group kickoff deal. We did a series – in the book of Acts. What was it called? We will. We will. Why, you, you picked that kind yeah. of as our small group and sermon kickoff deal. What was it? What was it about that that made you feel like, man, we need to... We need to, to study that? Acts? Yeah. Man, I, you know, if we're going to talk about what it looks like to be a community that's uh, connected with our eyes on Jesus, trying to listen and, and obey the Holy Spirit, man, what, what better book to go to? You know, this past week I was uh, talking with our uh, student pastor, Matt Vaughn about Matt. Shout out to Matt uh, about the power of of just you know history. He's been in that perspectives course and he's been studying some of those stories about those different saints of old and the things that they they dealt with and what that looked like. And I wasn't. Were you much into history like in high school? And I mean, no. you were math. You didn't, no. you didn't really. No. I, mean, I was. I, I was. In, I was. I was not really into school. <laughs> Well, me, me either, <laughs> but especially history, I just didn't have, but when I took that perspectives course, it, it really made me start to understand the power of, of those stories, uh, not that they're a playbook that we just try to, but man, learning how God worked with that, you know, that group of people, uh, when oppression came, how they responded to that, how they listened and obeyed the Holy Spirit, the way that they did communal living and authenticity and just, there's just so much, there's just so much there. It was a great, it was a great series, I really felt like. And I remember when we were kind of, we were going through it, we didn't obviously to make it through at all, it's 28 chapters, kind of like the first eight or nine chapters or whatever. There was this section that I was preaching on that was kind of like, chapter 4, chapter 5, and there's this, there's this story right there in the middle of it that wasn't exactly very we willy, we willish, we, <laughs> we willy, we, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we try to kind of, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't do it, so I just kind of just went, we went right, right past it, and, um, and, um, but I can tell you wanted to deal with it, because when we decided to do this, this series, it was like the first one you said. Yeah, so it's it's a really interesting story in Acts chapter five, uh, where these these people are coming to the apostles. What's 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 the background? Where where are we, Acts history expert? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, expert. Where are we in the kind of the the story here? Well, well, the church is still in Jerusalem, and they have uh, man, they've started to really have this incredible community. They, they're growing, you know, it's just growing like wildfire, but they're also beginning to take shots from the religious leaders. They have just prayed for boldness because they're, they realize that it's only going to intensify. And, and then it talks about how, man, this community is so tight. They're sharing all things. Uh, people who own land are selling their land and they're bringing that money and they're laying it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas is an example of somebody who does that. And then it says, but... Yeah, so so yeah, so they're 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 being really generous 
and selling things and distributing that money to anybody who has need. And in the beginning of Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1, we have this. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Boom. And great fear, yeah, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. I am 100% sure of that. (laughs) Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for that land? (laughs) <laughs> like okay so like so 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 ananias he does he he dies and then they just wait they just wait three hours three hours and then she comes in dee, 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 dee. like and peter goes hey um is this you sold this land is is this the price you got what are you thinking like if you're like in the crowd oh man just just shaking like, man, don't say it. Don't don't say it. Please say the right thing. <laughs> Please say the right thing. <laughs> is this the price you got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Mm. Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. A great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Is this one of those vacation Bible school stories? That yeah, it's a great Mother's Day sermon is what it is. <laughs> 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 prob- that's a problem with me. Like, I, don't, I don't really necessarily notice like calendar, things like that. I mean, obviously it Easter, just happens, Easter yeah. and Christmas and like here we are. Talking about this, so so they're giving so they're giving out these lands. So, so let me ask you this: What do you think? So they they they're selling land and giving away money. Like, what was really going on here? I mean, if he had sold the land, let's say for fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and said, "I'm going to donate half of that to to the church, and I'm going to hold on to the other half." Does he come to Peter and is like, "Hey, I sold this land. Here's half the money. You think he's good?" I think so. I mean, there's nothing in the story to tell us otherwise. It sounds like, even the way that, that Peter kind of says that, it sounds like that, hey, it was yours to do with what you wanted, but why would you? Why did you lie about it? Which, to me, there's just this huge uh, picture of authenticity that that this group, one of the main things that united them was just that they were they were authentic. And this play, you know, was... It was uh, Ananias and Sapphira putting on one face when there was really a, another reality, and I feel like, yeah, I feel like he could have he could have done it. He just wouldn't, needed to be truthful about it. Yeah, I mean, so theoretically, obviously, there are some people in 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 this church community that probably owned a piece of land they could have sold, and and, and, didn't, and, and just didn't, mm-hmm. and this didn't happen to them. There's people who weren't generous at all. I mean, it, this is. At a minimum, somewhat generous. They sold a piece of land and gave some of the money away. So I've heard some people that like they like they like to tie this to generosity, like this is the the, the sin is mm-hmm. generosity that they were not generous. That doesn't seem to be. Yeah, they're actually very generous. Was yeah. yeah, they they did a good thing, a relatively good thing, and yet ended up with a an incredibly severe punishment, and. Um, and, and and so, and again, the the whole thing, and, and the way they set up, set up sounds like a bad word. The apostles wouldn't set anybody up. The way they staged it, I guess, I mean, that's not a good word either for for the for 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 Sapphira. I mean, they gave her a chance to say something different, and she didn't. No, she got the chance. Yeah, and so so the big question then is why why this punishment for for this sin? 
And there's a handful of, of reasons and things that we could talk about of why essentially the death penalty for Ananias and Sapphira for seemingly doing something relatively generous. So we'll just say, first of all, what the sin is. I mean, it's kind of two parts. One is that they lied to, they lied to God's apostles. And one of the things that you see, like in, in the Bible is that it's not like from Genesis to Revelation, there's just miracles, 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 miracles. It's just nonstop miracles. It seems like that God is more wanting people to respond to him out of faith. Mm -hmm. And that miracles are something that God does occasionally. But there are a couple of seasons in which he is, they're they're done really intensely. And one is the Exodus, You know, when Moses comes to Pharaoh all the way through Joshua conquering the land. And the other one is the time of Jesus all the way this time with the apostles. And it seems that what God was wanting to do, certainly with Pharaoh and, and, um, and Moses, and even the people in Moses, that God is like, this, this is my guy. This is my guy. You don't, you don't mess with him. He, he's mine. I want you to know it. And I'm going to establish his authority with all of these things. And then you see that. I mean, Jesus comes and he does some signs reluctantly sometimes. He doesn't really want to do miracles. He's like, that. I don't want you to follow me because you saw me do something cool. I want you to follow me. But it seems like that also, again, you read, especially that first part of the book of Acts, that God is trying to establish in the minds of the people that these aren't just some rabbis. These aren't just some teachers. These, 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 are, these, are, these are my new Moseses. And so the, the level and the quality and the type of their miracles that they're doing, and, then it's, and, and it's like, these, these are my apostles. And then, essentially, what it says two different times, both with Ananias and Sapphira, it says, and great fear seized all. And then at the very end, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Suddenly you realize these aren't just some dudes. Right. And... Um, and so it, there's a significance to that, but something else, something that that Paul that, that that Peter says, you know, clearly Ananias and Sapphira were lying to Peter. But he says you weren't just lying to men; they were lying to God. So they lied to God's apostles. But furthermore, furthermore, they lied to God. What 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 do you what do you think? What is Peter getting at there? Because he makes that connection: you lied to the Holy Spirit. You're not lying to men. You're lying to God. Clearly, they lied to men. Uh, what it, what does it mean that they were lying to God, not just men? Yeah, I was thinking about it as a study that, you know, the uh, there's just a practical side of, I mean, somebody maybe found out and ratted him out to Peter. But but Peter, Peter knows. So the Holy Spirit must have revealed it to him. We don't have, you know, we don't know that anybody came in and snitched on him. So... Um, you know, practically, it's this sin against God because they may may have gotten away with it and nobody would have known, but but God, God knew, mm. and so the idea that that sin, even those hidden things that maybe nobody, no person knew, God knows. Oh, hold up, I don't know. God revealed. I don't know if I'm liking what you're saying here right now. Let me make God, sure I understand what you're saying. Is that even the sins that nobody knows about are bad? Yes. God, God knows, which makes them, you know, that there's this, this sin against God, the other one who knows all. But then, um, besides just the things that go on in your life, he also knows. But then there's also just the reality of, uh, of in God's kingdom, his standard. And, you know, we may look around and have a different standard between us, but in his kingdom, there's a standard. And to be in his kingdom, to be in his presence... His standard is what matters. The this this holy standard that he sets, and um, you know, I may I may speed in my car today, and you know, I'm actually endangering you or you know the other people on the road. But if you also speed, then then you're like, all right, well, he's spe- I, yeah, I, I speed too. You know, no big deal. <laughs> but because there is a law of the land, and when a law is broken, we're responsible to that law. Who's responsible to protect? It's just not. It's not just between us. Although it may harm somebody, there was less money maybe to provide, but the sin was against God. Okay. It was more than just between people. 
we may not ever be able to do this anymore because I don't know if I like what you're saying there either. <laughs> so you're saying that if I speed and no cop catches me, it's still, still a problem. It's still a problem. Hmm. hmm. We'll see. Yeah. So 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 I mean yeah. So the gravity of it, according to Peter, was about what they did to God. Mm. It's not just that you weren't as generous as you could have been, and it's not just simply that you lied to the apostles, which is a big deal. Again, I think God is establishing the apostles as somebody different than all the other people that have been leaders in the, in the temples or whatever. That's a big enough deal. But it is them lying to God. And God saw this in this moment, in that moment for what they were doing, for what he was trying to do in establishing this church, he took that offense and said, with, without any hesitation, just, so. just, they, they died. <laughs> yeah, Peter asked uh, Ananias why, but didn't even give him the chance to answer. Why did you do this? Boom. Boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I, th- I, th- I think one of the things I think it's important for us to take from this passage, and um, one of the things I feel like people say a lot is that the Old Testament God and the New Testament God don't match up. That the Old Testament God seems really, really mean. And the New Testament God, seen through Jesus, is really, really nice. And then, like, there's this hard break in between there, in between these two testaments, where God radically shifts. And we've done this before in a lot of Old Testament um, passages. Like, we did this in... Um, I remember over when we over a Christmas series we did, we we're kind of looking at the Old Testament stories, and so one of the things I like about what we do, we look at we look at quite a few Old Testament stories, and you you see the grace of God, you see you see God waiting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean the the story of the ten plagues is a scary story, but God uh. gave Pharaoh ten plagues, nine plagues, and they just got progressively worse. And in that is hints of grace. Mm. Hey, I'm the God of the universe here. You see what I can do? No, no, really. No, no, really. No, really. Even some of these things in judgment, we see the grace of God and the kindness and the compassion and the patience of God. But also at the same time in the New Testament, I mean, it's not like God used to really, 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 really hate sin. And now suddenly he's okay with it, and everything's kind of oh shucks, buddy. You know, you'll right. you'll get them, you'll get them next time. I mean, the reality of it is, they lied to the apostles, they lied to God, and God still hates sin. God hates sin, and um, the same God that hated sin and punished sin in uh, the in the story of Noah again. That, that's one of the other ones. Story, one of the stories we talked about, the story of Noah. Um, it took Noah over a hundred years to build that boat. And in one hundred years, God is saying to the world, Here's your chance, here's your chance, here's your chance. Here's your chance. And, and, and no one took it. Well, we see a gracious God that follows with punishment. But here, and we see the same thing. We see a little bit of what we like to call the Old Testament God. Um, but it's really just God. And so I think one of the things I think that this story can really help us with is eliminate that idea of, Old Testament God, New Testament God. Mm. There's just this God, and God hates sin. And so we use that phrase, God hates sin. It sounds like a good churchy thing to say. It's like, yes, yes, God hates sin. Sin bad, God good, God hates sin. But what, what do we mean? What does that mean? Why don't you explain it? It's like when we say as a church, pastor, we look at the, the scriptures and we say God hates sin, what do we mean by that? Why, why does God hate sin? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the holiness of God just leaves no room for, um, for anything that's unpure. And it's, it's just, the thing for me, it's just so relational. You know, when we, when we choose to, to go our own way, sin could, you know, be called that. We, just, we choose instead of going his path to, to go our own way, to do our own thing. In this scenario, you know, Ananias and Sapphira choose to, to lie. They're, they're a lie is a step of, hey, instead of giving and trusting, instead of telling the truth and being transparent and trusting with what this community thinks about us and that our significance is in God, 
they're, they're letting down and trying to provide for themselves. They're lacking trust. So all of it is relational. But this is another reason why it's, the sin is with God because it's so relational with God. And God wants this close fellowship with us. And when we choose to sin, we hurt people, but we also just get, turn our back and go our own way and lack worship, lack trust, lack you know, faith. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a, it's a direct shot and he hates it. He wants us just to embrace him, to be close to him, to trust him, you know, to tell the truth and just trust him with the outcome, right. you know, to do the things and, and let him be God. And um, every, I know every, every time if I look back and I think about sin in my life, it's always me trying to take some shortcut to, to replace God or to, mm-hmm. to stand on my own and not humble myself and, and be in close relationship with him, you know, and trust in him. So you used a word there, a very churchy word. You used the word, but because of God's holiness, sin is offensive to him. Can you just, for, for the sake of those of us who are still kind of, we, we, I what think, does, what, what is that? What is that? What, is it, what does it mean that God is holy? What is the holiness of God? It means that he is just set apart. He's set apart in his power. He's set apart in his purity, that there is, there is nothing... Um, unpure in him which makes him totally different <laughs> right <laughs> you know if, if you ever get if you ever do this thing where it's like I, I i hate it like like there's there's a group of guys or a group of people and they're having a good time and then you walk in and then everybody feels like make, make a joke or they have to start acting with oh, 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 oh. Preach you guys here. Pre- pre- preachers here watch, watch your mouth or Somebody's got a beer or something. <laughs> it's, just, it's just water, <laughs> right? It's a, I hate that, by the way. Mm-hmm. Don't don't do that. I guess mm-hmm. now that I've said it, now everybody's going to do it because that's the kind of people y'all are. Um, <laughs> uh, In a snarky way. But 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 the idea behind that is someone very different than us is here. I need to I need to change my behavior. The other thing is that so you hear people you know you use a use some inappropriate language. And then this old expression is, uh, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? <laughs> right? The idea being, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be like that if your mom were here. Right? Because, because mom is different. And I think there is just this sense in which God is very different. Mm-hmm. And we do emphasize, because of what Jesus did, we do emphasize how, how God wants a personal relationship with us. How God is um, a dad. In fact, we've, we talked about this. You know, God as, God as dad, God as husband, are very loving, intimate, relational components. Mm-hmm. But the thing that, you know, father has, there's an authority piece to it. There's also a king piece to it of, of in, in, in the metaphors that the Bible uses. And there's just certain things that you cannot say or do to the king. If I say to you right now, maybe some man, I'm going to punch you in the face. That's nothing. If I put on Twitter that I want to do that to the president, that's another level. If I actually said it to the president's face, that's another level. There's just these authority levels. So you've got this... this the, 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 your mom is too nice, is too good to say something ugly to, but then you've also got the way that you treat authority is different. And sometimes I do think we do spend a lot of time talking about how relational and loving God is. We do lose just a little bit of how different he is and how, like, like, like if, if Jesus were standing here, like literally standing here, would you say that? Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that if Jesus were here. And, and he is. And yet, <laughs> and yet he is. It's like, I would not want to offend Jesus in this way. Yet, like you said, even the things that are done in private are offending a great, awesome, holy, and powerful God. And so... God hates sin, and this is probably the, the, the least insightful thing that will be said on this stage all year. So if God hates sin, uh, so we should avoid it. <laughs> that seems really, yeah. I mean, like, like, 
So that's your application today, guys. Don't do the sin. Right? I mean, I, it, it, it just seems real simple. But, like, like stop. Just, just, just don't. And I think one of the main things that we talk about, and, and I think it's important, when we talk about not committing sin, it's, um, hey, you shouldn't want to do this. Like the rules that you have for your kids. Why do you tell your kids when they're little, don't play in the street? Yeah, protection. Protection, protection for them, yeah. It is in your best interest. It is in your best interest to follow these rules. And so we talk a lot about that. Hey, you're damaging your relationship with God. You're, you're bringing damage to your own soul. You're hurting other people. It is in your best interest to not do the sin. This is a different reason. This is not, this is like, it doesn't have anything to, this doesn't have anything to do with you. Because of who God is and his character and his very nature, you should not do sin. And so, you got your kids, you got, you got all the kids, right? You've got, you've got, you've got <laughs> not, all of them. Not all of them. <laughs> It's, fu- it's, it's I mean, funny. Got a few, it's yeah. funny. I've I have three, and that seems normal. You've got four. And suddenly, that's a lot of kids. You got four kids, man. That's a lot of kids. Yeah, you know, when twins, when twins come, like you kind of twins. Twins. That's like that's like a multiplying effect. <laughs> like you went from two to twenty, and you have twins. Just, boom. So you, you got you got you got a kid, and um, you tell them, "Hey, you shouldn't. You should don't don't do this." And you can tell that their little brain is going. About whether or not they're actually going to obey you or not. What do you think is going on in that little were you, brain? Were you in our backyard yesterday? <laughs> you seem, <laughs> no, just, seem to have I was, seen this. I was in my own house yesterday. <laughs> but go ahead. What, 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 what is the calculation that a kid you think is making about whether or not they're going to follow a rule or not? I mean, part of it is, is daddy serious? Is he going to do anything about it? Mm-hmm. They're usually not. I, I can tell they're not, they're not really thinking through the reasoning behind it. And mm-hmm. I think for me, a lot of times, that's the frustration. Like, I want to explain the reasoning. But you can tell that the reasoning's just not being heard. I, I want to do this. Dad says no. Dad's, what? Well, Dad's silly. I, is he really going to stop me, or am I just going to going to do it? Because yeah. I really, I really want to do it. Yeah, it's the Eve in the Garden of Eden calculation. When Eve saw that uh, that 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 the the fruit looked good, and it would probably be tasty, and what that snake said kind of makes sense. She took it and ate it. There wasn't any consideration of, but God said, and I am scared, and and uh, and to, I don't want to offend God. I'm scared to offend Him, not necessarily because I'm going to drop dead, but but just because of, because of how awesome He is, how great He is. I I I don't want to do that. That is enough. That that sin is highly offensive. And to, to the God who loves me, to the God who gave me everything, that's enough. It's a child's calculation. If, if I'm going to edit my response to a sin based on my perception of its personal value to me. We serve a good God. And so thankfully, all of the sin, all the things that he puts in the, in the sin category are things that are damaging. And all the things that he puts in the you should do these are enriching. It's that's 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 good. But even if you look at it, like I'm reading through, it's like I don't know that I like this one though. I don't know that I understand the purpose of that one. Therefore, I'm going to move this into some sort of optional category. And you can imagine Ananias and Sapphira having a very similar talk to that. Well, you know, old Jim and Jeannie, they didn't even um, they didn't even sell their land. And you know, we got we you know. Okay. We need we need some money for something else. We'll just we'll just we'll just give them half, and and God should be happy with that. And and but well, but let's not what, what you let's not tell them. <laughs> let's not tell them. It's like, yeah, it's like, we still want all these points, and, and you know, and, and, you know, it's it's fine. I've determined by my rules that this is fine. And in a in a very shocking sudden way, the whole church learned something that we need to learn it's not about it's not about my ability to calculate it's not about what i think it is about god and so i just encourage you man i just know again that there all of us out there i don't have to be some sort of prophet to say that 
There are people s sitting in, in living rooms and outside all over, all over Northwest Arkansas right now who are walking around with a private sin that they've decided for whatever reason is really not as bad. It's really not that big a deal. I don't really, I don't really need to worry about this. It's, it's fine. And it's not fine in part like the things that we say all the time because of what it's doing to you. But let's go another level. It's not fine because of who God is. And so let's live lives that honor God by avoiding and stopping the sin that he hates so much. So as we move to a time of worship, man, I just encourage you. I just encourage you to just to have a time of confession. God, I am, I am sorry. I am sorry for who I am, for what I've done. I'm sorry for the sin. I'm sorry for the offense and the hurt that I've caused. And then let's just ask that same Holy Spirit to um, give us the strength and the courage to be overcomers of these things that are holding us back. So you can do that as we worship. And as always, if you want to, go get the elements of communion and you can come, you just take them right there where you are and just, um, and just celebrate and thank, and thank God and reflect that sin is not the end, that death is not the end, but that Jesus Christ died so that we can have life. But let's just spend some time in worship and reflection and prayer about breaking this stronghold that sin has on us and saying that because of who God is, I want to live for him. Let me pray.